morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning, John. Uh, so we'll uh, give it a stall time here to uh, pick up uh, people looking in. If you're <clears throat> joining us later on in the day, we'll trust you're having a good day. And mm -hmm. remember, this is the day the Lord has made and to rejoice and be glad in it. Um, so um, <clears throat> looks like we picked up somebody. <laughs> okay. You're not supposed to let people know how many people are watching because it's bad, bad, uh, bad focus. But we're off and rolling now. So, okay, so we are beginning to head into the Thanksgiving and the Christmas season. It's got its own special challenges for this time, 2021. Uh, we've got COVID in the rearview mirror, but um, it's also in our blind spot. Mm -hmm. So uh, we just need to understand that it is a mutatable pandemic that's not <laughs> not gone yet, and and uh, and understand that uh, for a lot of the world, there's a lot of suffering still going on, and we need to be prayerful and compassionate about it, willing to to uh, uh, pray continually that people uh, won't won't get caught in this thing. Uh, so. <clears throat> That's there, and then we've we've got this growing hatred uh, in our in our society. The uh, all the call for the Christian jihad or holy war, almost from those who are seeking political power, uh, and even through violence, those calls are growing louder and louder. So our commitment to being civilized, loving truthful followers of Jesus is being tested. It's going to be tested during this time of Thanksgiving. Are we able to, with a, with a true heart, with an honest heart, truly thank God for all the things that he's blessed us with? And are we able to see once again what God has done in history by bringing Jesus into this world, uh, the first Christmas? And those are going to be our challenges. And, and, uh, uh, Kathy and I are, are praying that we can remain, uh, all of us can remain uh, people of the word, people of peace, mm -hmm. people of prayer, and a, a people who trust, who trust in Jesus specifically, that things are not spiraling out of control, but that he does have the whole world in his hands. And those uh, nail-pierced hands are going to come back again glorified and that's when uh and that's when things will be made right so throughout this christmas and thanksgiving season uh kathy and i plan to be right here online uh, each and every lord's day uh offering you words of encouragement encouraging you to keep going with the lord and walking with the lord and and uh you know lord willing i think you can count on that we'll uh, we'll be we'll be trying for that and um uh, in the meantime, if you're, uh, if you're interested in more of, of what's going on through the ministry of the Word here, uh, Pastor Dave on Thursday nights is going through Matthew at 6.30 p.m. And then we've got men's and women's group. If you, if you want a support system, want to talk about these scriptures and other issues in a more, uh, in a more safe um, environment, it's there for you. Uh, if you want to contribute uh, uh, to the ongoing effort, it's uh, zell, Z-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E at zoechurch.com. Uh, and if your bank supports Zell, otherwise there's a PayPal button at zoechurch.com website, and you can uh, uh, contribute to the cause there. Uh, and, and that's about it uh, for the announcement phase of this this morning, and uh, I'm going to ask my wife, Kathy, as is our custom at Zoe, to open us with a prayer. As is our privilege, right? Because the Lord has said that we can be persistent. So let's go to him for this morning. Lord, it's amazing to me. I know I say it often, but it's just so amazing that you would want to hear us. That uh, I know just speaking for this one human being myself, complainer royale <laughs> royal um i just pray you'd forgive my sins i pray you'd forgive our sins this morning right now that we could just stand before you knowing that you've made this 
great way for us to get clean and have a relationship with you and and then to be able to talk to you and it's it's not about how right um, we are when we come to you Lord but how right you are how good you are this is what your word is all about it's about who you are and your promises but not the way the world would write a book the way that you would write because of who you are and yet there's a lot in that book also about humanness and fallenness and sin and pain and i just uh, pray for all of us lord whatever the pain we're in this morning whether it's physical caused by injury or deterioration or whatever it is i pray for that that you would help each person lord if it's pain because of our of our life and the sin that has just weighed heavy on us we just pray right now we could get that forgiveness and instead of trying to make ourselves right we would just look to you and learn more about you to um, be able to have that relationship and i pray today lord that we could worship you that we could give you back just in our very um human vessels life we could give back something to you because we would acknowledge you yes we can acknowledge what a worm we are what terrible things we've done but we must repent understanding that you are who you are and you reward those who sincerely seek you reward us with you lord this morning and we will praise you because you are so worth it lord you are so worthy we give you this day in jesus name amen amen thank you very nice prayer again kathy uh, okay let me make a couple of adjustments here we have a scripture this morning in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and it goes from verse 13 to 18. So let me uh, read it first. This is Paul the Apostle writing, and this is the end of 2 Thessalonians. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. Take note of those who refuse to obey uh, what we say in this letter. Stay away from them so they will be ashamed. Don't think of them as enemies, but warn them as you would a brother or sister. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and in every situation. The Lord be with you all. Here is my greeting in my own handwriting, Paul. I do this in all my letters to prove they are from me. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's pray one more time. So, Father, once again, we're going to need ears to hear and eyes to see your word this morning. Uh, it will just be uh, a, a, almost like a form letter to us if we don't understand this is a deep personal letter, not only from Paul, but from you uh, to your Gentile uh, church saved from our society, headed toward glory at the second coming of Christ, this letter is to us on how to cope with the pressures and strains and stresses that are around us and how to be the people that serve and please you. So give us that, that wisdom this morning to take this serious. May each person who listens get at least one thing stuck in their craw so that they can't just shake it out, that it will settle in and it will cause a uh, reflection leading to uh, fruit for your kingdom as the word processes through our life and into the fruit that you want to bring from it. So, Lord God, we're asking for a blessing this morning as Kathy has prayed. We're asking for your presence, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, I want to do my introduction this morning with a short section of Scripture from Second Peter. It's written by Second Peter. Uh, it's written by Peter, uh, and perhaps uh, there are indications that this scripture was written uh, toward the end of Peter's life, <clears throat> perhaps after Paul has been martyred in Nero's persecution of 64 to 66 AD, and perhaps at the initiation of those uh, leading believers 
uh, in the world, around the world, who understood that as the persecutions from Rome begin, as Christians begin to be blamed for not only the fire that burned down Rome, but everything else that's going to come, uh, that, that the believers need, they need encouragement, they need, a, they need wisdom, they need to know that Christianity survives beyond Paul, even as it did beyond Jesus. Uh, and, and so they've gone to Peter and said, you need to write a letter to Galatia and Phrygia and the areas of, of outlying areas that are going to get hit. They're going to first find out that Paul has been killed in a, as, a, as a believer. And then they're going to find out th that the Roman Empire is going out throughout the world to kill Christians. So uh, uh, Peter, write something, will you? Write a letter. And, uh, and perhaps that was the occasion for Second Peter. Uh, it, it certainly, uh, there are certainly many indications historically that it is. So that's the context of the end, near the end of this letter of encouragement from Peter. He writes the following in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, starting at verse 13. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. And remember, the Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom of God, with the wisdom God gave him, speaking of these things in all of his letters. Some of his comments are hard to understand and those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of Scripture, and this will result in their destruction. And so here, uh, Peter mentions the writings of Paul, uh, and, and I want to point out a couple things about this to you. First of all, he, he calls him the Beloved, Paul the Beloved. Um, and and we might remember that John the Beloved uh, will, will write later, and just refer to himself as the beloved one. Uh, Paul the beloved here, uh, Peter's term for him, ha is a person who uh, perhaps is now uh, martyred and in, in history as uh, an apostle who served faithfully all the way to the end as Paul's writings uh, uh, express the desire. But also notice here in this, this passage of scripture that we just read from 2 Peter that Peter considers all of Paul's writings on the same level with the rest of Scripture. He says that, that men who are unlearned, and, and by the way, um, that word that's translated ignorant, ignorant in your new living means undiscipled. They are untaught. They're untaught the word. So they read the words of Paul. They have no foundation, and they twist them to mean something else. And they're also unstable uh, men do this. Men and women do this. They are... They are, there are people who will take his words, who don't understand the authority and force of, the, uh, of them, and turn them into something different. And this is what they do to other scriptures also, Peter says. And so we understand from our uh, Protestant uh, connection, and, and we are Protestants primarily, uh, post-evangelical Protestants, whatever that's shaping up to be, uh, but we understand that the Reformers' doctrine of, of sola scriptura guarded them uh, against putting non-biblical writings in with biblical writings. Uh, sola scriptura is only Scripture. Scripture uh, compares to Scripture, uh, gets you understanding. You don't need uh, the encyclicals or the, uh, the bull, uh, papal bulls, and you don't need all those things to understand what God's will is, that the scriptures compared with the scriptures will get that for you. So that doctrine of, of sola scriptura guarded the reformers against the, uh, the blending and mixing of, of traditions with the scriptures in order to carry on things that, that people wanted to keep going with. But uh, what it doesn't guard against uh, is turning the historical reality of first century Christianity into a system of idealistic theology, which is kind of what the reformers are, is their Achilles heel, that, that it's a system of theology and not an ongoing, unfolding 
revelation of who God is through history, through sacred writings. And, and so it's easy to detach the, um, the meaning from the history of the first century and put it into a system of thought, uh, a, re, uh, a systematic theology, if you will. So the study of scriptures uh, as canon, as a measure of God's revelation uh, of Christ to people, the, the development through the first century is critical to understanding that it was finalized at the book of Revelation, after the book of Revelation, that now the whole thing is finalized. That it wasn't just a book written in Jesus' day or after Jesus' day, but the New Testament is 27 uh, books that are written through the course of history, uh, and they are written by humans inspired to write uh, what God wants written as God, uh, in a complementary fashion, works on humankind and history through the first century. And so all of that's together. History is knit closely in with the understanding of, of, uh, of, of Scripture, and it gives us the way to properly interpret Scripture so that we don't twist it and turn it into a system of idealism that has, no, uh, that has no connection with the practical realities of life. So that brings us around to the letters of First and Second Thessalonians, which we finished today. Um, these were uh, among the first letters of the New Testament written, and they were written to one of the first Gentile communities of faith in, uh, in the world, apart from what God did among the Jews and bringing Christ into uh, the old covenant world, having fulfilled the covenant, having uh, uh, gone to the cross with our sins and been raised from the dead and taken up into heaven. The message now of the resurrection was rejected first at Jerusalem, then into Judea, and it was rejected. Now it's going outward to the outermost parts of the world, uh, it, it, it went to uh, Anatolia or, or uh, uh, Galatia, Phrygia, as we mentioned, primarily to the Jewish synagogues where it was rejected once again. And now God calls the, the world to have the gospel. And if you look at uh, uh, Paul's Macedonian vision in, in uh, Acts uh, chapter 16, verses 9 and 10, uh, Paul is called by the Holy Spirit through a vision of the Macedonian man. Uh, Macedonia is the area where, where Philippi, Thessalonica, all the way down to Athens, that whole area. Um, well, actually, Achaia starts uh, just where Athens is. But that Macedonian area uh, is, is where these letters are written to. And in the vision, the Macedonian man says to Paul, come over here and help us. And in verse 10 of, of Acts chapter 16, Paul interprets that as meaning, bring the gospel to us. Bring us the gospel because we need to be saved now. So this is the outgoing circles of the spread of the gospel as told by Jesus in Acts chapter 1 verse 7. You'll go to Jerusalem first, then Judea, and then, and then, the, then it starts to spread out uh, uh, to Galilee and then the uttermost parts of the earth. And this is the uttermost parts of the earth, the last phase going to the Gentiles. And perhaps we're, we are at the uh, last wrinkle in time, the uttermost time of the Gentiles, the outlying edge of Gentile salvation and the reception of the gospel before things wrap up and the Lord comes again and the kingdom of God is in our midst. Oh, that sounds so good. I don't know. It's not just an age thing. It just sounds good. So, uh, so... This letter, or these two letters, actually I'm going to talk about them together, written by Paul, they're scripture. They are, uh, they are from Paul, but they are also inspired by God. It's his message, it's his gospel. Uh, they tell us things about Gentile faith and believing in Jesus to the point of salvation. They, they give us instructions for that. And they are meant to meet us where we're at, coming out of a Gentile world of idolatry, and trusting in all the wrong things, worshiping all the wrong things, serving all the wrong things. And so we pick up in chapter 3 and verse 13, and th verse 13 resumes 
uh, addressing the community of faith. Now, Paul took a little diversion or a digression, if you, were, if you will, in verses 6 through 10. Um, he, he talked about a particular mindset that the community of faith was to stay away from. And that mindset was the, the, uh, the disorderly, the idle, those who wouldn't work, those who would attend Christian fellowship and, and feed off of what's there, but they wouldn't care to get their own food and wouldn't care to uh, provide for their own selves. And there's a lot of symbolism in this as well as uh, uh, basic dynamic instructions. This, you know, when Paul says, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat, he's not saying you should be starved to death. What he's saying is, if, if you don't understand the curse that's on the earth and that you're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow to get by, that the blessings are, uh, the blessings are going to come later when we eat from the tree of life again freely and fully, uh, as Adam one day, Adam and Eve uh, one day did. Uh, w until that's restored, we're going to accept our place in this world and say, by the sweat of our brow, we are going to live in this cursed place knowing that God has reached into that cursed place and promised us salvation and is now helping us to walk in the first steps of that salvation, delivering us even from the things around us. And I've, I've, found, I've found through my life that when work gets the hardest, the Lord is there and He is there to help. He's there to lead us on. He's there to help us take the next step. And sometimes there's only just one step ahead. Uh, this is an aside. It's not in my notes. So I hope I do this right. But I've been listening to the, to the uh, next to the last, uh, the penultimate version of the rise and fall of Mars Hill, uh, the Christianity Today uh, audio um, journal of what happened with Mars Hill Church and the, the rise of it and the fall of it. And this last episode, at two and a half hours of listening to this internal struggle and fight within the ecclesiastical fight and the damage caused and the and the point of excruciating soul searching by the men and women of families and and uh, people of, of ministry who are driven to just the edge of almost madness by what was happening and i and i realized you know the the church, the Christian church, the contemporary evangelical church has really been scourged in a lot of ways in the last 30 years, the last three decades. And, you know, it says in Scripture, let judgment come first to the household of God. And in a way, some of the, some of the judgment has come. And, and there's been a lot of pain and a lot of hurt and a lot of uh, cursedness has, has hit people even though the church is an organization blessed by God, it is still human organization at a lot of levels, particularly the management functions and the mega church operations and the cults of personality and the things that have been brought in that are not, uh, not, not authorized by Scripture, not called for by Scripture, and really are man's attempt to make something good even better. And, and so... We understand that sometimes our work gets so wearisome we want to just give up. And the Lord is always there for the next step. He's not always there to just pull back the curtain and say, oh, this is all going to work out all the time and see how this fits here and that fits there. Uh, take the panoramic view of the highway of struggle you're on and you're going to see all the exits and all. You don't get that. You just get, here's the next uh, fork in the road. Take this one. And uh, a lot of times that's all you get. And a lot of times that's all you need, really, because the anxiety up ahead sometimes can, uh, can scare you off. So, so Paul has been talking about that. He's done a digression. And then in verse 11 and 12, he's directly addressed those people. And what he's done is warned them. He hasn't, uh, he, he hasn't um, uh, condemned them. He's warned them not to think the way they're thinking. And he's told the community of faith, don't let these people pull up a chair and sit down at your love feasts and, and just partake of your ideas, your thoughts, your prayers, your koinonia, your fellowship, as if they aren't in, uh, in another 
um, another mode of existence. Because what they're going to do is they're going to share with you their wild uh, theories and ideas, their undisciplined uh, uh, thoughts. And, and, you know, people have those thoughts. And if you have those thoughts, it's okay. They just can't prevail at the community of faith. They can't become the community of faith's view. Uh, I can remember uh, one time at, at, uh, at Zoe when we finished a service, this is probably a decade ago, uh, a young man who I, who I love dearly uh, came up afterward and, and started telling me about these apocryphal works that he'd been reading, um, these, these uh, works of, of, of people who have been disproven to have any value of Scripture whatsoever, and I mean contemporary apocryphal works, people that claim to be speaking for God and just had wild, crazy ideas. And it was okay that he had those ideas. It was okay that he could share them with me. Now, if he had taken the microphone and taught the community of faith those things, that would have been terrible. That would have been disaster. But it was okay for me to know that those things are going on in his mind and I could I could gently talk to him about each one of those things. I could warn him about uh, the, the errors that were in those things that had been discovered by others and, and uh, were, were an indication that you shouldn't be following those things. And, and that was the context of it. It was okay to have those ideas. Those ideas just couldn't prevail. And that's the purpose of Paul saying, don't let them sit down at the meals with you and, and share their life as if they're not being fraudulent by having a view that, that's a freeloader's view of, of not only um, uh, the provisions of life, but even the deliverance of the gospel. Because you see, if the gospel doesn't deliver us from the hardship of the curse, then that's not the full gospel. You know, we live and we struggle under the curse and God delivers us even now, and through our faith we get by, and, and we keep calling on him, and that enhances the, uh, the understanding of the gospel. So that's what he's been through. Now, I make a differentiation at verse 13. Uh, Paul now is going to go back to talking to the community of faith, and the next uh, a group of people, subgroup of people in the community of faith, they don't prevail, but they are there, is a different group from the idlers or uh, the disorderly found in verses 6 through 12. That's a different group of people. That's a different mindset. Those are uh, different people. And the warning that Paul has for this new group of people is, is more stringent than, uh, than, the other work, uh, other, um, uh, than the other group of people. So, um, so the group of people here uh, is is um, going to be defined in a second. But he resumes by saying, focus on doing the good. Don't grow weary. So I want to just remind you that, uh, that, that the gospel came into Thessalonia and it freed the Thessalonians from having to have hopes in this world through, through the Roman Empire, through the things that their government could do for them, through... Uh, through um, uh, any hope of humanitarian uh, uh, getting together and, and building a better world. The gospel came in and it freed them to be doing the good. And we want to just, uh, because this is the last time we're in Thessalonians, make sure we understand the fourfold points of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, the gospel came as, as Paul was instructed to bring it to the Thessalonians or to the Macedonians, uh, the gospel came in and uh, Paul brought it. And it was brought to them by his, by his word. He spoke to them the gospel. He told them the gospel. He taught them the gospel. He was sent by God to do it. And it was the word of the Lord. Okay, so um, that's the initial point of 1 Thessalonians. Now, remember in 1 Thessalonians, Paul said, well, I saw you guys uh, 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 receive it, and so I kept on teaching the gospel. I kept on teaching you the word of the Lord. And, and then later, he, he, uh, after Timothy goes there, he says, I know now that you believed it because it took root. You, you are the called because when the gospel was preached, you responded to it. And so remember, our 
teaching, preaching, warning, reaching out to people will be responded to not by the urgency of our plea, but it'll be responded to by God enabling a person to respond to his gospel. That's what makes the gospel responded to, not the eloquence of your argument. But uh, you have to be just truthful enough to understand. You have to just be in that bandwidth of truth. And when you're in that bandwidth of truth and you teach it or preach it or share it with somebody else, if they are of the Lord and called by the Lord, they will respond inside. That's His doing. That's His work to His message. You are just a part of that system. So Paul said that he brought it. Uh, he also said that they were converted by it. They left their idols, their former way of coping with life and all things. They left that behind and they got to the place where they desired to serve and please God. And so that's the second point of 1 Thessalonians was that uh, the gospel converts us. It changes us from being Gentiles to being followers of Jesus. That's a gradual process. Sometimes it, it goes over a really long period of time, uh, a lifetime even. Uh, sometimes it, it just barely starts. Uh, remember our beloved Joe Risser, 85 years old, and just finally believing and following Jesus. And just a few years later, the Lord took him home and completed the process real fast. I mean, it just barely started and then it was completed. And uh, the, the, um, the last shall be first and the first shall be last, Jesus said. And my good friend Harry Friedman from the Villas used to always say hallelujah when I said that because he was 95 years old when he came to the Lord uh, and he realized that, uh, that he was one of the last and he's going to be one of the first. And that's the way God is. That's God's, God's wisdom and God's judgment. So they were converted by the gospel. It changed everything about them, and they then started to live to please God. And then once they got past that stage two, they were told to wait or persevere for the return of Jesus from heaven. They weren't to look to anyone else. They weren't to solve uh, the issues of life in any other way but they were to wait, to wait on the Lord from heaven. And that's not an easy thing. Somebody comes along with a lot of promises, a lot of hopes. They come along with a vision or an agenda and they rope us in and they sap our energy and make us work for them. And then we find out it wasn't the gospel after all. We are to wait for the return of Jesus from heaven or to endure here or to persevere and that's what we learn from, from John's gospel. Endurance is the mark of the disciple, the one hupomone, who endures underneath of the labor of living in this world, being called to believe each and every day, believing in Christ continually. Then we have the authority and we are the children of God at that point. And then uh, the fourth part of what Paul brought to town in Thessalonia was that we are being rescued by Jesus from wrath at the present time and ultimately in the future when the full wrath of God is poured out. So you don't have to work your way to salvation. You don't have to do things that make you a good boy or a good girl and they, they don't have to accumulate and pile up to where they un, undo all the things you did before you knew the Lord or do, undo all the things you're doing while you know the Lord and aren't doing them right. Uh, that's not the way this works. This doesn't work by, uh, by our uh, now becoming religious people and doing more religious things. We are free from that. We're going to be rescued from the wrath in this life. If you believe in Jesus and, and, you're, and something bad happens to you, it's not because you're being punished personally by God. He doesn't punish personally the followers of His Son, Jesus. They are free from that wrath. Now, he might correct us and guide us and discipline us. And, and sometimes when we don't listen to him, he, he escalates a little bit of the warnings. He, he escalates the, um, uh, you know, the, the stakes a little bit so we will hear him. And then sometimes people shut that off completely. They won't hear any more warnings. They sear their conscience. And then God will use the things of this life to speak. He will speak to them. But his, his intents are never the punishment that's coming with the wrath of God. His intents are correction 
And, uh, and so uh, that's, that's what is brought to town. And because of that now, the salvation that God promises is free. It's given as a gift. You hear it, you believe it, it converts you, you wait for the finality of it, and you allow it to rescue you, and now you're free. But you are free to love. You are free to do good things. These good things that you're that you're going to do, they're not um, they're not the they're not why you're you're going to be saved. They're not why you're not under the wrath of God. They're part of uh, the gospel that's been promised to to you that you are free to do good. And that's what he says in verse thirteen: Never get tired of doing good. The doing good is, is a really key part of understanding uh, your day-to-day activities. These are the things that you need to be doing. You need to be loving each and every day. This is not a moral goodness that he's talking about. You're not to scourge yourself of, of perhaps moral indiscretions and try to be good that way. The good here is to do loving things to all people on an instant by instant basis so that good is still being done with all the hostilities around us. Let me read this portion of, of scripture also from Paul. And this is in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And this expands a little bit on this idea. I'm going to read verse 17 through 19. Paul, writing to Timothy, tells him, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. So notice the expansion of the good there. It's to be a generous, giving person, to be a loving person, doing good things. I would venture to say that each of you who hear this this week will probably meet 3 to 20 people who you have an opportunity to do good, to do a good deed for, to to, uh, do something loving toward. Uh, And even if it's just to walk away from interaction with them and pray for them. Even if it's just to uh, hear the cry of their heart and and comfort them. Or it might be something very practical to give them uh, a helping hand, to let them cut in front of you in traffic, to let them go ahead of you in line at the market, to to, uh, hear out their complaints and their anger. We're supposed to be doing the good. Jesus comes back. He says those who are doing the good are going to come forth to a resurrection of life. So Jesus is doing the good. He wants to be doing the good, and he wants to do that through you and uh, and me. Not so that we can be saved. We're saved because we believe in Jesus, but because Jesus wants to do the good. So that's, that's as much as I can expand verse 13 to you. Paul gives us that focus again, uh, that focus of, of, of doing good. And, and that's what our activity is t- to be. And the duration of that activity is all the way up until Jesus returns. That's how long we're supposed to be doing the good. And remember uh, uh, the incident earlier in, um, in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 1, where he, he talked about your rest as a, as a follower of Jesus. Your rest from all of this comes at the second coming of Christ. In verse 7 of chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians. Then he'll give you rest. You will have that rest at that time. So agape for until the second coming. Not, uh, it's not a, a moral position. It is an activity that you do on a daily basis. And uh, so let's, um, let's go to verse 14. And verse 14 starts out with make a note. Make a note to self. Take a note. Literally, that's what it says. Make a note to self of those who are refusing to obey what we say in this letter. And, and, and Paul refers to his own letter, his own letters, his own writings. Okay, Let those who refuse to obey uh, make a note of them. Because you need to note that they're not in obedience to the word. 
Now, we're not talking about you're judging somebody. We're talking about you're observing something that's, that's going to be very obvious to you, that, that you don't need a lot of discernment to, to decide. Um, this comes about because people uh, don't listen to the gospel, don't listen to the teachings, don't listen to the leaders who are teaching uh, any more than they listen to other people. So you're going along in a church for a decade and all of a sudden a politician comes along and tells you to do something else and you have no qualms about, oh, I think I'll do that. Uh, that sounds more powerful to me. There's no, there, there's no consideration. Well, well, one person's got their life dedicated to the Lord and is, is called to lead a community of faith, but another, another person is out serving themselves, but, but there may be more in it for me than that. Um, you'll know, you'll hear in their voice what they're saying, that they're not really obeying the teachings of Scripture as they're taught. You know, one of the beauties of a small community of faith is that God emphasizes certain things at certain times. So uh, God may be working with a community of faith to be more generous, to be more loving, to be more civil, uh, any number of things. He doesn't work on everything all at once because you can't get everything all at once and you can't get to that place where all the projects are finished up at the same time. And so he calls a community of faith to focus and emphasize a certain thing, to share their thoughts, to share the teaching, to share their wisdom, what they're learning, to grow together organically as a community of faith. And, and so some things are taught and some things are taught later, okay? When someone's going against the things that are taught, they're not with it. They're not, in, they're not on board with the community of faith and the work of grace that God is doing. And, and so it becomes obvious in the things they say and the things they do, they're going against what's being taught. Um, I, I tried to think of, um, of some examples of this that that uh, might be helpful, but um, you know, I don't, I don't know that you need a lot of examples. We live in, in such a time where, where there's so many ideas and so many uh, untruths circulating, going around, so many conspiracies, so many things that are just, like if you're gonna listen to them, you're gonna get sucked down that rabbit hole. And uh, you know, and, and if you're gonna, if you're gonna get, go down into the rabbit hole and then think, well, I, this is fun. I'm going to see what's down here. Uh, you're going to be in a world of trouble. And that's, that's basically what Paul is saying here, is let those people get into their world of trouble. He says, stay away from them. He says, uh, don't keep company with them. This is the same word he used in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 to the man who is, uh, who is immoral, who was uh, having an illicit sexual affair with with a relative, okay, and, and then being in the church and going, ah, see how free we are? We can do anything in Christ. Um, Paul called the Corinthians to put their pride down and, and push that man out because he's not to be there pretending to be a Christian when he's acting that way. Now, Paul doesn't, um, Paul doesn't say he's not a Christian. He says he can't be a Christian and be acting that way. So Paul taught the Corinthians, you've got, to, you've got to cast him out in the hopes that he will ultimately see the error of his ways and be saved. And, and, uh, and so there's, there's a fine line here. The people that are going against the teaching verbally uh, that Paul is doing in Thessalonica, they are to be stayed away from. They are to be pushed aside in terms of uh, hey, we're not going to sit in here in a conversation and have you contributing your rebellious ideas when, when God seems to be doing this other thing in our midst and, and we're all of, of, of pretty much one accord in that God's gracious and this is what He's working on now and this is the way He's calling us and you got this other bell you're ringing all the time and, and uh, Paul says stay away from them. Now I know how, how hard this is uh, for you to, to think in terms of, well, that's not fair, or how do we idealize that? Um, you know, we used to have this old maximum, maxim that used to float around. It used to help people be Christians, you know, all those refrigerator sayings. And one of them was, God cleans his fish after he catches them, not before. 
So the people that, that are brought in to the community of faith are at all different levels of, of being clean, okay? Uh, and, and what God wants to do is clean them. And the method of cleaning them is, is this process of being around those who are cleaner, uh, being around those who have seen the errors of the ways of certain things and live other ways and, and have a consensus on what, what's of the Lord and what's not. Uh, and, and God's way of cleaning people up is to let them see, well, you know, this behavior here, this really isn't going to fly in this group of people because they really don't. Uh, they really don't accept or acknowledge that that's of the Lord or truthful at all. Um, there are dramatic examples in our midst um, uh, right now, currently in our in our American society. Um, there are people who are who are toying with QAnon theories, conspiracies all the time. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago there was a uh, there was a rumor that John F. Kennedy Jr. would be resurrected and appear at Dealey Plaza where John F. Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. So two weeks ago, hundreds and hundreds of people lined the streets of Dealey Plaza. More than were there when President Kennedy drove down the street and was assassinated, waiting for the resurrection of John F. Kennedy Jr. so he could appear on a political ticket as vice president in the next election. Okay, so when he didn't appear, the rumors that started in the crowd were all these other people supposedly were resurrected. So now you have, you have all these people going to see a resurrection that didn't happen. <clears throat> and now you, you hear all these things of, well, so-and-so was resurrected and, and they're alive now. And you have this craziness that, that if, it, if it prevails in a community of faith, you're not going to be able to tell... Uh, you're not going to be able to tell people the truth when they have craziness mixed in. So if, if Pastor Dave and Pastor John and Pastor Jess says, stop listening to QAnon, I don't care how interesting this seems to you, this can torch your spiritual life. Um, and, and let's say we begin teaching it directly, like teaching about resurrection, the resurrection of the dead, when it's going to happen, uh, evil, when it, how it's going to come down all the way to the end. We start teaching that from Scripture, and we're all in accord of, yep, that's the way it's going to happen. There's going to be a time of restraint of the Antichrist all the way up till the, till the near the end, and then he's going to be let loose, but then Jesus is going to destroy him by the sword of his mouth. And we're teaching that, and someone is there teaching this other thing. Well, no, actually, God's going to raise up these other political figures who are going to lead us to the promised land. That is someone that needs to be stayed away from. They need to be put out of the midst of those who fellowship with the teachings of Christ, and they need to be put off somewhere so that they will be ashamed, Paul says. And, and he doesn't say for you to shame them. He says, stay away from them, because by staying away from them, they will ultimately be ashamed. So here's the principle. If you don't walk with the Lord and hear His truth and be submitted under the teaching of scriptures and, and uh, be part of a community of faith, that lifestyle will lead you to shameful things, which you will understand when you are in them. You will not be anchored in Christ. You will not be okay. You will drift and you will wander and you will ultimately get to the point where you're saying, what have I become? What have I done? What have I done to myself? What have I done to my family? And you will, you will end up uh, shamed, ashamed. That's what he is saying. In verse 15, he says, don't think of them as enemies, but warn them as you would a brother or sister. Warn them, you can't go this way. Pastor Dave is talking about uh, serving Jesus only. Uh, and, and loving uh, Jesus as the Word of God. Uh, so I'm not going to be thinking in my heart that, that the Word is, is that, that Jesus is just a human being, that He's you know, just another person, and He was a great, great prophet, a great uh, person of history, a famous person, but nothing more. I'm not going to be thinking that. I'm not going to be uh, uh, persisting in that view because I've been warned that view will not save you. That view will lead you to destruction. Okay, so I think you get it. Uh, most of the time, this is not a fine shading line. This isn't somebody heard the teaching and didn't get it or needed to go over it again. Or This isn't like misunderstanding. This is someone who's not obeying the teaching. Okay, 
And, and that's, that's what you have to do. They have no hope if they don't get that from the community of faith. The community of faith just has got to say, not here and not in our house. This isn't going to prevail. <laughs> and, uh, and neither are you if you don't you know, abandon this, this, this weird uh, non-obedience to Scripture. Obey the Scriptures, okay? So um, then we're going to get to um, this... this um, this point where the person is warned and Titus 2 8 teach the truth avoid criticizing other or avoid the criticism of others just teach the truth in a good way and then those who oppose you will be ashamed God will bring shame to them you don't bring shame to them you just teach the scriptures you just obey what's taught and right what's taught and true and then God himself will bring the others uh, to shame. We already talked about the cycle of how God corrects. And, and so not as an enemy, not as an outcast. So we've got different levels of responsibility to those around us in the community of faith, okay? If people uh, want to bypass the, the curse and go right to, uh, right to the rapturous presence of heaven without uh, enduring uh, a walk with the Lord, without discipleship, um, you know, we, we can't have them at our koinonia times of fellowship if people are going to resist the teaching the clear teaching of scripture uh, we can't have them with us they are they are going to be uh, they're going to be uh, stayed away from and this we have to trust god has a plan to bring them back we don't give up on them we pray for them continually okay so verse 16 and 18 uh, the end of the letter real quickly uh, is prayer salutation and benediction the prayer verse 16 is powerful uh, he, he says in verse 16, May the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times in every situation. Uh, this is a, a, the Hellenistic optative for those of you who have dabbled in Greek a little bit. Same one as in Romans 15.5. It is, it is a, a, a truly a prayerful, blessed wish eloquently stated. And the the prayer of this is that the Lord Jesus himself is the Prince of Peace, the source of peace. And, and that's what you've got to understand about peace. Peace isn't um, something that, that, you, um, uh, that you get apart from Christ. And so the prayer for Paul is that you will get the gift of peace. Now, this is what Jesus said in, in his ministry at the end of his ministry. Uh, he talked about uh, being the source of peace. By the way, Leviticus 26, 6, one of the first uh, instances of God promising peace during all the priesthood prescriptions, God says, if you obey these things, I'll give you peace. You won't even be afraid of wild animals or weird bugs. You will have peace. You'll be able to sleep at night. The walls will not be crawling. Okay, And, and so peace is, is an internal state of of the absence of hostility. It is the, um, it is the confident trust in God's salvation. That's the, the definition, if you will, of peace, uh, emulating from Leviticus 26, 6 onward. Okay, so Jesus is a source of peace. And, and first of all, there's peace with God. And that's what, that's what the scriptures teach us Jesus is the source of. Uh, Ephesians 2, 14 through 18. Uh, he, he's, he is, he's broken down the walls between Jew and Gentile, but he's done that because he's made peace with God in heaven. So in Christ, whether you're Jew or Gentile, whether you're Old Covenant, New Covenant, there's no wall of separation. You don't have to be an Old Covenant person and say, stay away from, from anyone that's, that's not of our, my covenant because in Christ, we're all of the same covenant. Now, it's not in contradictory to say uh, you're to you're stay Stay away from those who reject Christ. Okay, so there's no contradiction there, just to be sure. But Jesus has made peace, peace with God through Christ. But then he makes peace with each other. And it says in that Ephesians passage that he's put the hostility to death, the enmity, the hatred. He's put it to death on the cross. Another clue about peace. You must put hatred to death. Hatred has an existence almost of its own. It's fed and fueled by the enemy of our soul. It's, it is 
something inside of you that you don't resolve by thinking through hatred again and again and again. Somebody ever really upset you or you think they did you wrong and you think about it, you think about it at night, you think about it as the days goes on. You know, you never ever work your way through that uh, just working your way through it. It grows it, it feeds it, you rehearse it, you go over it again and again, and the hatred grows. Hatred's got to be put to death. It's got to be overcome by Jesus. It's got to be, uh, it, it's got to be um, conquered by, by the peace of the Prince of Peace. And that's what Jesus said. And, and Jesus, on the night he was betrayed and the, and the day he was crucified, the uh, night before in John 14, 27, he talked about uh, giving them peace even though he's about to be the object of such hatred, such hostility, he's going to give them peace. It's his gift to them. Verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 33 of John's gospel. Uh, he, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I to you. And then Colossians 3.15, the peace that Jesus gives is, is the peace that in our heart, it needs to be the umpire. Okay, now I don't know if you, if you, you know, all sports have the referees. Uh, baseball has its umpires, and hockey has its referees and its linesmen, and football has its referees, and uh, basketball has its refs. So, uh, so all sports have referees. And Jesus said, in your heart, let the peace that he's going to give you uh, be the umpire, <laughs> be the ruler. Uh, is this thought uh, peaceful? Uh, is this thought of the Lord? Is this thought going to prevail? Am I going to think about this and rehearse this and go over this again? And if it's not of the, it's not the peace that comes from Christ, or if the peace that comes from Christ has been given to you, then that's the umpire. That settles it. That's it. That's the call. Okay. So uh, a lot of times the Lord will help us through something by bringing us to a place of understanding, of compassion. We can understand the other person, uh, maybe give them some grace, maybe give them some a place to stand. And something we know that came from the Lord. That's insight, that's wisdom, that's peace that came from the Lord. Now that has to prevail in your heart. That has to be the umpire. That has, when the things come back up again, that has to rule. That has to be uh, the source of your peace from that point on. So uh, he is... The, the Prince of Peace, and he is also the giver of peace. And Paul is praying in verse 16 that peace would uh, be given to all the disorderly, the, uh, the idle, and the disobedient. All of those are included in this prayer. He wants all of them to have the peace that Jesus brings. And so that's, that's what we're working for, toward and for all of us. Uh, Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So this is to be our, this is to be our forward-looking uh, way to deal and cope with the things around us. Verse 17, authentication. Paul takes the pen from the amanuensis, the writer, and says, here, I'm going to write this down. You can see the way I write this. This is the way I sign all my letters. And uh, when you see this marking, I don't know how bad it was. Paul maybe had bad eyesight, so he may. Have you ever seen people sign something at a giant circle when they first start, and then the rest of it just goes down into like woodpecker stuff? Um, so Paul had something distinctive. So if anybody had ever seen one of his letters, they knew he signed that. And if they hadn't seen a letter from him, they, um, they would just have some other signature and it wouldn't be authentic. And so... Uh, interesting, in the days of fraudulent uh, 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 theft in our era, that there was already that type of fraudul fraudulent activity back in the ancient era, and, uh, and a lot at stake with the Word of God. And so Paul authenticated his own writings that way. And then in verse 18, uh, may uh, the grace that Jesus gives extends to all people. So, uh, he wants all people to experience the grace of God. It's the grace of God that will enable you and I, the community of faith at Zoe, it's the grace of God that will enable us to persevere and love until the second coming of Jesus. It's that grace. It's the grace of God that will allow someone who's been idle, 
who's been uh, lazy, who's been uh, not taking work seriously. It's the grace of God that will help that person turn that around and be a hard worker and, and put their nose to the grindstone and be able to, to be a part of, of blessing others and helping others. And it's the grace of God also that will help that disobedient, critical person who everything they hear from scriptures, they reject and they, and they just blend with everything else. It's the grace of God that will help that person see that you're to make place in your heart, to sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and especially realize that His Word is binding upon you, that you need to obey His Word. Not obeying His Word is to disobey Him, Himself. And it's the grace of God that will help you with that. So, um, in a nutshell, we might say that what uh, 2 Thessalonians then adds to 1 Thessalonians is that after receiving and being connected with the gospel, that we're now able to trust and endure and to love all the way to the end. That's what 2 Thessalonians adds. There's going to be a terrible ripple in, in safety when the Antichrist is revealed, but he's restrained up until the very end when he's fully revealed. Until then, we're to keep our focus on Jesus himself and to walk with him day by day, persevering, enduring, making sure we take the challenge of loving others that we are, that we are uh, brought in contact with through life. Love them. Love them when we see them on, in the workplace, we see them in the community, when we see them around town, when we see them anywhere. We're, we are to look for opportunities to love because we're supposed to be doing the good. We're supposed to be the loving ones. So um, that's it. We might uh, summarize the whole First and Second Thessalonians experience uh, from um, chapter 1 of Second Thessalonians, uh, live a life worthy of His calling. Uh, from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, uh, to accomplish the good things of our faith uh, through the power that He gives us. And then in 2 Thessalonians 3, 5, realize that God's prompting us in our heart to love and endure. That's the prompting of Jesus Himself. And so then if He gives us the power to, to follow out and follow through those promptings, we will accomplish and do the good, whether it's something simple and easy to do tomorrow or whether it's something that takes a lifetime to accomplish by following Jesus, by allowing His enduring power to carry these things out, we'll be numbered among those who have done the good at the end. Would you pray with me? So, Father, we cast our studies of First and Second Thess Thessalonians into Your midst right now, into Your presence. We ask that You would... Uh, use this, this material in our lives whenever you need to, whenever you see fit, whenever you want to, so that we can uh, go forward, live in this uh, life of, of continuing pressure, this, uh, this urbanized hardship that we all feel, the busyness of what's around us. Help us to not stress or fret over it, but to give it to you, to allow you to lead us day in and day out into those places of doing the good, Help us to release the final uh, outcome of our salvation to you and admit that you've saved us through Christ. We can add nothing to it. All we can do now is live in that freedom you've given us, doing the good and enduring and waiting for Jesus' return from heaven. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you with his word this week. I pray that many instances would come to you that give you hope and life again so that you can follow the carpenter from Nazareth in the footsteps that he leads before you in this life. In his name, amen.